feminist theory and trauma theory. These two theories have recently become heavily intertwined. Separately, they have evolved over the last few decades. But the one thing they both have in common today is that the application of both of these theories together tend to result in innocent men being unjustly arrested, prosecuted, and even sometimes sent to jail. Well, half the time. In the 1970s, feminist theory used to revolve around women's right to work and education and sexual liberation. These days, feminist theory seems to revolve around men being inherently guilty of violating women and children sexually on some level. Thus, feminists must do everything possible to drag any man's name through the mud and have his life and livelihood destroyed, ultimately succumbed to martyrdom in the name of protection for women and children and society as a whole. Enter trauma theory. The original application of trauma theory, or post-traumatic stress syndrome, began in the context of combat war veterans and survivors of a singular disastrous or serious life-threatening event. More recently, trauma theory has been expanded to include anybody who may have had a bad childhood, or a failed career or relationship, or issues with depression, personality disorders, eating disorders substance abuse issues, thus a new category called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. This type of trauma theory is more and more frequently being applied by social workers, therapists, and counselors in unregulated and regulated settings to help a client identify a cause for their current troubles. For example, a vulnerable client who presents with substance abuse issues and is seeking help may be easily convinced their substance abuse issues are a result of experiencing past traumatic events that may have happened to them, but have become buried inside their psyche and masked by the substance abuse. This type of therapy leads to a very similar scenario as recovered or repressed memory therapy. Just replace repressed memories with trauma theory. Add some feminist theory, and you end up with a client eventually believing all their current life failings and emotional instability is due to some past abuse from a man in their life. But they have been coping all along and avoiding the trauma by succumbing to vices that block the painful memories that the therapist will help them to identify and name as experiences of abuse. Now think about it. At this point, who is benefiting? The client has been brought to a life-altering realization that something horrible might have happened to them, and they identify a person from their past that they must now learn to hate and isolate themselves from. No, this agenda does not sound like a positive outcome for the client. The therapist, however, has been paid to have multiple sessions with this client to reach this template conclusion. Yes, the therapist is the only person here who is benefiting thus far. Professional psychology and psychiatric bodies around the world have for years been saying that any so-called recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse arising during adulthood therapy sessions cannot be known for sure to be true or false or confabulated memories. These same bodies also warn that courts of law must take extreme caution when complaints arise from such memories in the absence of affirmative corroboration. In Canadian courts, however, this advice has yet to be taken. In fact, we have a series of precedents or case law in place that actually justify the prosecution and conviction of a person, usually a man, in this exact scenario. This group of precedents systematically erodes the reasonable doubt standard and reduce it to a balance of probabilities standard. Therefore, historical allegations of sexual abuse are indeed already a special area of law. And it has been this way since the 1980s, after the criminal code was changed by repealing the one-year statute of limitations and repealing the corroboration requirement, both specific to claims of sex abuse of any kind. Last year, 
in 2015, Ontario just finalized and implemented the Psychotherapy Act of 2007. It sat on the table, unimplemented, until last year. As a result of implementing this act, a new re regulating body, the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario, or CRPO, was created. All therapists currently calling themselves psychotherapists without the appropriate training as now outlined by the CRPO must stop using the title psychotherapist. The act also employs guidelines for professional misconduct. In this context, that sounds comforting and it implies that there must be safeguards against dangerous and misguided techniques such as recovered memory therapy or hypnotic therapies, right? But not so fast. The CRPO guidelines contain no such safeguards and in no way does it govern any techniques used by therapists. So this act does nothing to curb the danger of prompting damaging false memories. The CRPO lists its recognized education and training programs in accredited schools on its website. One of the schools it accredits is called the Toronto Institute for Relational Psychotherapy. A snippet taken from their therapy description page reads as following. The principles of relational psychotherapy taught by the Toronto Institute for Relational Psychotherapy are drawn from self-psychology, intersubjectivity theory, relational psychoanalysis, psychodynamic developmental theory, trauma theory, and feminist theories of psychotherapy. This is an institute that trains psychotherapists as well as um, practices psychotherapy on clients. This institute looks no different than the rogue therapist with no qualifications in the early video that I have in my part three of, of this series. Only this is a government sanctioned accredited institute. Ever hear of CAMH or the Center for Addiction and Mental Health? This is also a government sanctioned Canadian institute. They are a nonprofit institute taking donations, a designated World Health Organization collaborating center or a WHO collaborating center, and closely affiliated with the University of Toronto. In 2003, an assistant professor at U of T named Laurie Haskell wrote a book for CAMH entitled First Stage Trauma Treatment, a Guide for Mental Health Professionals Working with Women. This book has been distributed by CAMH since 2003, and it is currently available to purchase. I purchased a copy myself so that I could do this video. Lori Haskell has a doctorate in education and calls herself a clinical psychologist in private practice. If you look her up in the College of Psychologists of Ontario database, her business address is that of a residential home on a residential street in Toronto. She appears to be a career feminist, academic, researcher, and presenter who may see some clients in her home office from time to time. She is currently posted as assistant professor in Division I, Equity, Gender, and Population, which, if you look at their page, has no clear core teaching on equity, gender, and population psychiatry, nor a specific clinical fellowship program. Yet, this division claims their total research funding for 2011 to 2013 was nine million dollars. Lori also claims to have educated judges, crown attorneys, police officers, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nurses, service providers, and community groups in the area of violence against women and children and the neurobiology of trauma. In the introduction of her book, she states, Mental health professionals sometimes focus in a fragmented way on different symptoms, for example, depression, inability to maintain close intimate relationships, and panic attacks, not realizing that the client's apparently chaotic presentation reflects underlying complex post-traumatic stress. Lori is referring to untold stories of childhood abuse that may be constructed during therapy sessions. On page 106 of her book, she states, 
Identifying and naming an experience as abuse or neglect is not an easy task, nor is it a discussion that can be covered in one session. Most often, the therapist will have to review this issue repeatedly and over time, and present it from a variety of different perspectives. In other words, it may take many expensive sessions to convince a woman that she is a victim of childhood abuse when most likely she is just experiencing depression, panic attacks, or difficulties with relationships due to current mental instability issues that are apparently going to be ignored in this type of therapy setting. In a recent February 4th, 2016 CBC interview with Anna Maria Tremonti's The Current, during the Gomeshi saga, Lori had much to say about how a woman would naturally forget details of an alleged abusive incident, have memory lapses, and tell an inconsistent narrative because they are supposedly conditioned to freeze and dissociate instead of fight when attacked. And yet, they will remember things like the exact number of holes in the ceiling tile, which she says can be a corroborating piece of evidence in a court of law when prosecuting a man for sexual assault. Essentially, she's implying that if a woman fails in telling a believable, consistent, and coherent narrative of being sexually assaulted, but can recall a provable detail such as the number of holes in a ceiling tile, that should be enough to validate her claim and convict a man, have him jailed, and his life forever ruined. Let's have a listen to this extremely scary theory straight from the horse's mouth. So after a traumatic event, um, how do details come back to us? So they often um, are, you know, frequently in the person. They can't get them out of their head. It's The, the problem is people, um, when they're interviewing victims, aren't focusing on the central details. So the central details are what happened in your body? What do you remember thinking? When did you feel a shift in your experience? What is, the th what is the image you can't get out of your head? Instead, people are interviewed in a linear narrative, and they can't give a linear narrative because it's in sensory fragments. So eventually, through um, going into therapy or um, having time to process, they'll tell the story maybe from in its completion. That takes a long time for their brain to process it. I mean, people can see it if they're in a car accident. They don't tell uh, a, a coherent narrative about a car accident. They'll talk about the moment they knew they were going to crash or the sounds of the glass shattering or the sounds of the break. And they'll, that's what will predominate them for, for days and hours after the event. What, um, why might someone try to fill in the blanks if they can't recall the detail? I, we all want to create me meaningful narratives. And so people say, well, what happened? Most people focus on, well, what were you doing? What happened? Where were you? Did you fight? Did you scream? So people want to make sense of it. So they try to create that story. And they're not lying. They're, some of those details are vague, but they're there. But, you know, what they don't ask them enough of is, you know, what was, what was going on with you. They're going to remember their reflexes, and they're going to remember central encoded details. Was it, you work with, you, you train police yes. and, and lawyers on, yes. on this specific issue. Exactly. Because there are some sort of then preconceived notions about how we're supposed to remember things, both exactly. in the public and for professionals. Absolutely. Then. And so people think this is what the brain should be attending to instead of what is the brain capable of attending to. So we have all this neuroscience of saying there's all these changes in the brain, and yet we allow victims to be on the stand being asked all kinds of detailed questions about peripheral information, which is not relevant. And so, so should these errors in, message, in memory be used uh, to prove an alleged victim? Uh, is no, there's, I mean, if we change the focus, if neuroscience changed how please interview victims changed how Crown attorneys understood and led evidence and how judges could um, assess credibility, this would get rid of a lot of the myths about what people were supposed to remember, what they're supposed to be able to talk about, and the kinds of actions they should have been able to take. Still, the, the question of did they fight, did they scream? We're not conditioned to fight. We're conditioned to freeze and then try to, to flee. And we can see this in all kinds of other scenarios, but it's the first things people suggest around someone who's sexually assaulted. And so how would a lawyer prove a case without using those peripheral details? Uh, focusing more on understanding the neuropsychophysiology of what someone experiences. Someone who had a consensual sexual experience, 
wouldn't talk about going into a trance state or feeling frozen. Um, a prosecutor in the States who specializes in this said, he asked him, well, what were you doing while this was going on? And the victim said, I was lying, counting the holes in the ceiling tile. And he said, do you know how many holes were in the ceiling tile? She said, 36. He had someone go and take pictures of the ceiling tile. There were 36 holes. So, so that would prove that she was in the state she said she was in. Who would in. do that during a, um, a consensual sexual experience? Exactly. So if they would pay attention to what the victim is actually experiencing and doing, if they dissociate, they might remember a spot on the wall or something in the person's apartment. Something might stand out for them in the car. And that, is, that could be corroborative evidence if those kinds of details were paid attention to. Fascinating. Thank you for coming in. Thank you very much. Dr. Lori Haskell is a clinical psychologist in private practice. She's an assistant professor in psychiatry at the University of Toronto, and she trains lawyers and police on the neurobiology of trauma. In her book, she writes a chapter on the six dimensions of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Those six dimensions are strikingly similar to the ambiguous symptoms police and other interviewers were trained to look for in children during the satanic panic ritual abuse days, as I highlighted in previous parts of this series. The six dimensions are as follows. First, affect dysregulation or difficulties in regulating emotions. Two, dissociation and changes in consciousness or amnesia or hyper recall or spacing out. Three, changes in self-perception. Four, disturbances in relationships. Five, somatization or unexplained physical pains. Six, alterations in systems of meaning. I don't even know what to say about that one. The author refers to this symptom list as a basis in convincing their client that they are victims of childhood abuse. She also discusses how to ground a client when they are experiencing flashbacks, dissociation, or self-injurious behavior during a therapy session. She refers to these as stress responses, but what isn't discussed is what the therapist is doing to trigger such responses during a session. Those triggers would likely be a hypnotic regression uh, method of some sort. Um, or some sort of trigger that will actually trigger a psychosis that is just embedded within the client's brain. But a regression method employed for the purpose of memory retrieval is what can create false memories or experiences. In her book's glossary, she refers to a technique called EMDR, or Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. In this context, it is a type of therapy that uses sets of eye movement or other forms of bilateral stimulation to try to help the client remember, neutralize, and resolve the upsetting memories at the root of current psychological disturbances. Needless to say, there is little scientific evidence backing this form of therapy as legitimately helpful in such a context. Therefore, it is nothing more than a controversial therapy. It sounds to me like just another form of hypnosis. In the area of Canadian law, a precedent was set in 2000 in the Supreme Court of Canada. The case was R versus DD, and it states, There is no invaluable rule on how people who are victims of trauma like sexual assault will behave. Some will make an immediate complaint, some will delay in disclosing the abuse, some will never disclose the abuse. Reasons for delay are many, and at least include embarrassment, fear, guilt, or a lack of understanding and knowledge. This last bit is key. The lack of understanding and knowledge. This is making allowance for a complainant to say that she can't coherently describe her alleged experience as sexual assault because she may not have understood it at the time that it was an assault. Enter the therapists or counselors who have likely spent several sessions convincing these complainants that they are victims and have helped them construct such a narrative. Hmm, doesn't that sound like grooming? Grooming a person to believe something is true when it likely isn't, and empowering them to act on it 
as a means to justify the financial gains to be had by the groomer? By now, you might be asking, how is this type of therapy and victim manufacturing allowed to continue at the expense of innocent men's pocketbooks, reputations, security, and freedom? The answer is quite simple. They justify the jobs and exorbitant salaries of sex crime police officers and feminist crown prosecutors looking for maximum conviction rates. And they justify lining the pockets of the slimiest of the slimy defense attorneys. There is no money in honesty. There is no money in assuming an accused is innocent until proven guilty. If we as a society want to restore principles of honesty and the presumption of innocence in our justice system, the corroboration requirement and statute of limitations in sex offense cases must be restored. And feminist therapists who groom clients into victimhood must be stopped. <laughs>